will get a very large indication that is uh, autoimmune diseases. Um, these, I'm sure you're all aware, is, is a huge potential market. And in particular, we are focusing on uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, primarily because this technology was vetted to about a dozen BCs some time ago, and they all recommended this uh, indication. And as you can see here, rheumatoid arthritis itself is a huge market. Uh, these top three are all what we call anti-TNFs, which are cytokines. And, um, and, and macrophage migration inhibitory factor is also a cytokine. And in fact, it's upstream of TNF. So if you add up all these numbers, this is nearly $30 billion in, in 2013. So it's a huge market. Um, and, uh, so we feel that uh, autoimmune therapeutics uh, is a possibility to, to attack this rheumatoid arthritis and in fact it's a platform company so we can hopefully go through to other autoimmune diseases as well. As I said, it targets macrophage migration inhibitory factor. I apologize for the name. It's a historical name. It happened to be an activity that it had, but it's better to think of it as a, as a pro-inflammatory cytokine as we've learned more about it. Um, and as I'll show you, this particular protein underlies all autoimmune diseases. So as I said, it's a platform company based on uh, a medicinal chemist at the Feinstein who developed small molecules to inhibit this, this protein. Uh, to date, we, we put in uh, in the neighborhood of $3 million to develop this. And I, I'm going to pitch here today that we feel we need about $2 million to get a very meaningful value inflection point. Uh, the company management, the most important person on here is Ron Birch, who had a distinguished career in small and medium-sized pharma, and then went on his own and became a serial entrepreneur. And Ron is uh, the acting uh, CEO of uh, Autoimmune Therapeutics. Myself, I'm kind of the chief science officer. Um, I'm the PI of a SBIR, NIH-funded small business grant that is being used to progress this technology. Kurt Minogue, another person at the Feinstein, the director of our Office of Technology Transfer, is uh, handling the corporate and business development. And finally, as I mentioned, the medicinal chemist bottom, Yusuf Alad, uh, is a, a, a researcher at the Feinstein who thinks about biology in a very interesting way. He's one of the rare, in my mind, medicinal chemists who can actually talk to biologists, and he understands the biology. And he's extremely creative about coming up with small molecule inhibitors for pathways. And he's really, his lab is kind of a node at the Feinstein. A lot of researchers come to him, have got this interesting problem, can you help me uh, figure out an inhibitor for it? So how do we think this technology has worked? I've represented here a kind of a standard cell, in this case a macrophage with a, with a nucleus in the middle. Um, and what happens during inflammation is that macrophage migration inhibitory factor, or MIF, is it's, it's, for, it's in the cell already and it gets released during inflammation. So MIF levels go up outside the cell. And downstream of MIF is this tumor necrosis factor. Remember, this is the $30 billion market right now. Another uh, downstream of TNF is something called interleukin-6. This is another target for autoimmune disease. It is also upregulated in autoimmune disease and another uh, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is just beginning. It's, it's, uh, but both of these are very big markets. And so what we feel is, you know, what we'd like to do, the hypothesis is if we turn off the activity of MIF, we can stop autoimmune disease. So what we do is we in, in give the, this uh, autoimmune therapy of small molecule, which are represented by these um, kind of bowling pin structures. And the idea is that they would come in and bind to at least a subset of the MIF molecule and decrease its activity. And that will keep the downstream events like TNF and IL-6 and so on from occurring, and you'll resolve inflammation. So that's the basic technology. Um, as I said, MIF is involved in a lot of uh, all autoimmune diseases, basically. I've got a small list here, but if we look at the animal models, MIF is upregulated in all of these where these check marks are. You could, we've made antibodies that inhibit MIF's activity. And we've used these in animal models of disease, and where all these check marks are, they've worked. So if you inhibit with an antibody, you can stop uh, preclinical models of autoimmune disease. <laughs> Similarly, small molecules, which the technology we're pushing forward, 
will also inhibit this activity and they work in these diseases. <coughs> the other thing you can do with mice is you can knock out a protein. If you knock out MIF, they don't get the disease in these preclinical models. And finally, if you look at humans, we know that MIF is also upregulated in all of these diseases. And there are polymorphisms in humans where if you have that polymorphism, you make more MIF. And if you make more MIF, you're more susceptible to disease. So it's true in humans as well. Um, and again, we're going to target uh, rheumatoid arthritis. This is, uh, we know about MIF at an angstrom level. It's been crystallized. We know that it forms a homo trimer, represented by these three colors. And interestingly, there's a hydrophobic pocket here, and I'm going to turn this on its side so we look in at that pocket. And I've represented in these yellow uh, amino acids that are known to be critical for the pro-inflammatory activity. What Yusuf Alibet did was to make small molecules that sit in this hydrophobic cleft in three places, and they inhibit the pro-inflammatory activity. His proof of concept was something called ISO-1. He's the single inventor on this. You can now buy it from CalBioChem, and researchers who use who look at MIF would buy this to, to use in their animal models of disease. We don't think ISO-1 is the correct one to go forward into the clinic because it's not orally available and it has some pharmacokinetics details that aren't favorable. But we have a number of other scaffolds. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but we think about our intellectual property deeply. We use reputable outside counsel to help us file and we go for things like composition of matter and um, not just single entities within all these groups, but rather a, a chemical genus for all of these. So there's a lot of space protected here. And finally, methods for inhibiting myth and uh, combination treatments and so on. So looking at some human disease, these are uh, people with rheumatoid arthritis. This particular group took 58 individuals and simply separated them into those by looking at the amount of myth they have in their serum those that have low MIF levels below 50 nanograms per mil, and those with higher MIF levels uh, greater than 50 nanograms per mil. The greater than 50 nanograms per, per mil is the maroon color, and the black is the low MIF. And this is a plot of disease severity. So people with very bad disease here and very little disease here. At baseline, they start off about the same. This is timeline here. Three years later, after disease, you can see those which had high MIF levels have much worse disease than the other ones. Similarly, at six years, it gets even more progressed. So if you have MIF, there's a correlation between if you have the amount of MIF you have and the, and the severity of the disease you have. Well, our prediction is if you brought down the amount of MIF, you'd resolve the disease. And we can kind of do that study with the following slide, where 50 people with rheumatoid arthritis were given anti-TNF. Recall, this is that $30 million, $30 million uh, market. And then looking at the levels of MIF that they have at baseline and following anti-TNF therapy, and you can see at 16 weeks, their amount of MIF comes down, and at 52 weeks, it comes down a little bit more. So again, a correlation between the amount of MIF and the severity of disease. So, and it could in fact be that the reason the anti-TNF works is because it's bringing down MIF as well as anti-TNF, as well as the TNF levels. So, these uh, anti-TNF therapeutics have been a godsend. They've really, really helped enormously in autoimmune disease. But interestingly, there's about 30 to 40 percent of patients that fail to anti-TNF trials. So, there's a market there that is not being addressed currently even with this great therapeutic. Another problem with this therapeutic is that it's extremely expensive. These biologics are very hard to make. These are large proteins, and they're very expensive. And they typically need to be injected, which is not the ideal mode of administration. And finally, they require a cold chain. They have to be refrigerated for storage. So what we have with, uh, with our technology is um, an oral inexpensive uh, small molecule that can be taken as a pill and it's stable at room temperature. And remember, this is the most proxi proximal cytokine that's upstream of uh, tumor necrosis factor. So in terms of competition, uh, the best one, I think, is this Avenir, a, a California pharmaceutical. They did a deal with Novartis where they had an upfront payment of uh, $10 million, and uh, they will have a final payment of $200 million, assuming certain milestones are met. 
Ferry Pharmaceutical purchased uh, Cytokine Pharmasciences, a, a Philadelphia-based company, <laughs> relatively recently, uh, for an undisclosed payment. That is the technology that Yusuf was on, so we actually know that this undisclosed payment was significant. Um, and we're in dialogue with Faring. It's not a technology they're interested in moving forward. They purchased CPSI for other reasons. So we've been talking to them about perhaps bringing it back if it made sense. Uh, they're also, large pharmaceuticals, as you know, are pretty much dead for research. But uh, it's interesting that they've all been looking, several, some of them have been looking at this target as well. And finally, I would argue that our company is well advanced of the other ones that are kind of playing in this space as well, because primarily we have the world expert on its inhibition. So uh, there's a you know a real multiple of flip there. And so this is I think the most important slide is uh, we are here at this pre-lead uh, stage. We've got an SBIR to figure out the lead, and that's going quite well. We need uh, the $2 million, and we've got some skin in the game here. We need the $2 million to do the scale up and the toxicology. And we think that we could then have a pharma deal or a series A with additional money, we could do a, a several clinical trials and have a pharma deal. We never expect this company to be a, a de novo company. Uh, the value and exit, again, the biologics are very expensive, so we have an entry here. And again, this is just to summarize that the, some of the recent activity, and again, these are some fairly nice multiples that have occurred. So I can, I can really end there. That's, we'd like $2 million to do FDA trials uh, for these things and the, and the management team. Thank you. Any questions? That's a great question. I think, the, I think the best argument for that is if you completely remove the protein from mice and you have a strain matched animal that is wild type and one that can make no myth, that animal is completely normal. And even if you look at, I mean, there are some very subtle differences if you look at some of the immunological cells. But um, now you might say, well, what, what is myth doing? What these cytokines do is they're a balance. And they're very good to have when you get an infection or an injury. But when they get out of whack, that's when you get disease. And people with autoimmune disease have these things out of whack. So knocking it out completely is obviously the extreme. And I would argue that's not what you want to do, because these animals are uh, susceptible to some disease. But if you could <coughs> use an inhibitor and just bring that back down, I think that's, and that's the approach we're doing. But it at least tells you the difference. But at least it's only in that half. Exactly. Yeah. It's, not, it's, not a, you know, it's not a bad thing to totally knock it out. Yes? Regarding your IP, <coughs> assuming this is actually uh, brought to market, you're going to have a proof of concept of something which, as you say, is a good product, oral, not antibody, etc. What do you have locked down as far as a method that says, you know, you can't develop another inhibitor? Well, so the composition of matter would, would govern the particular <laughs> entity that they're using. So right, that's that. Apple, but do you have a method of addition of this brand? We, um, I forget, that some of the, you know, the patent takes forever to work through. Of course. I believe some of the scaffolds do have that, and we're working to, with con, you know, we're, we're working toward that. I think we can achieve it. Okay, Joe, last question. Is the synthesis of the molecule scalable? Uh, yes, that's one of the nice things. That, that $2 million, it, it only takes about 200000 to scale this up. It's pretty cheap to make, and it, is, it does appear to be scalable, at least to this small, large scale, if you will, that we've done. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks,